Hi, I'm Tony, and this week on Little Wars TV, we're going to recreate the Battle of Agincourt. Um, the Hundred Years' War is one of my favorite periods, and it is arguably the most famous battle of the medieval era. It's a colorful period full of famous and, and flamboyant historical figures. Henry V, Edward III, the Black Prince, the Duke of... Are you going to name any French lords? Uh, no, wasn't planning on it. <laughs> Well, there goes our French audience. Eh, no great loss. In this episode, we're going to give you a 60-second primer on the Hundred Years' War, and then Greg and I debate the age-old question, who really won the Battle of Agincourt? We each have our own theories. Was it the heroics of King Henry, the firepower of the English longbow, or the sheer incompetence of the French nobles? After we settle that historical debate, I'll be running a unique four-player war game to refight the battle and see if the French are doomed to repeat history, and the loser in our game will face punishment fit for a king. Are we going to do the entire episode from this muddy farm field? It seems fitting. Some historians would argue that the muddy field was the single greatest contributor to the English victory. Sure, but we're a classy wargaming club, and sitting out here in a farm field in lawn chairs feels a little lowbrow. I have a plan for that. And problem solved. Much better. The Battle of Agincourt occurred 75 years after the outbreak of war between England and France. So here's a nice 60 second history of the Hundred Years War, courtesy of Little Wars TV. The Hundred Years War officially begins in 1340 with Edward III, King of England, also declaring himself King of France. In the interest of time, let's just say that his claim was born of a complex family lineage, brazenly opportunistic, and partly a response to French provocations. Edward wins an important naval victory at Sluice in the summer of 1340, followed by a landmark victory at Cressy in 1346, made famous by the use of mass longbows. But it is the king's son, the Black Prince, who seemingly wins the war ten years later, annihilating a French army at Poitiers, capturing the French king and prince in the process. This leads directly to the Great Peace of 1360, when the French concede a partial defeat. In exchange for no longer calling himself King of France, Edward is granted full sovereignty of vast territories on the continent. Less than ten years later, the French renege on the treaty and attack English holdings. Twenty years of sporadic, inconclusive campaigns follow. In 1396, both sides are exhausted and declare an uneasy truce. And that brings us to the next phase of this never-ending war, Henry V's invasion of France. That was pretty good. 75 years of history in under 60 seconds. Let's talk a little about the Agincourt campaign itself. Good, but maybe you better start by reminding people why the campaign suddenly resumed in 1415. Well, it was a period of instability. King Henry V was a young king and trying to establish himself both at home and abroad, and he also decided he could take advantage of a period of instability in France, a, a sort of civil war between the Dukes of Orleans and Burgundy. Henry organized the largest English army since Edward's first invasion 75 years before. He landed in Normandy with over 12,000 men and immediately got bogged down in a long, costly siege at Harfleur. While Henry did capture one of the most vital fortified ports in the region, the siege gave the French enough time to muster their own army. Some of Henry's nobles argued that at that point he should have just rested on his laurels and sailed home to England. That probably would have been prudent. Ha! Prudent! Prudent was not Henry's style. Remember, he has a large army still under contract for the rest of the season, He's just been successful at Harfleur, and he marches his army across Normandy to Calais. Historians disagree on whether he's marching just as a show of force, or whether he's actually trying to lure the French into battle. Whatever his intent, the march to Calais was not as easy as the English hoped. The French army kept swelling in numbers, shadowing Henry's march along the way east. They blocked his path at every turn in a well-executed campaign of maneuver to cut off the English from reaching the coast. And that is exactly what happens. On a damp October morning, outside the small chateau of Agincourt, Henry's small English army meets a vast French host of 
14 to perhaps 40,000 troops, depending on which of the historical accounts you want to believe. Now, you and I are going to air some of our disagreements about Agincourt here in a second, but I think we would both agree that the actual French numbers at Agincourt were somewhat less than what the inflated contemporary accounts would lead you to believe. Oh, certainly. The French army is probably no more than 20,000, but even so, it greatly outnumbers the small English force. We're going to refight the battle in our war game, but the historical action was less a battle than a slaughter. Henry routed the French in what might be the most lopsided victory in English military history. But that's where the debates and disagreements over Agincourt tend to begin. How exactly did the English manage such an incredible victory? And I know that you and I each have uh, some of our own pet theories. We do. But first, let's discard the so-called great man theory that the battle, sorry Shakespeare, that the battle was won by Henry V due to his personal <laughs> grit and drive. True, he was a brave warrior and personally experienced, but that's not what won the battle. But that is what the contemporary sources really tended to push, both the English eyewitness accounts and, as you mentioned, of course, Shakespeare, very famous for pushing that theory. Henry is outmaneuvered by the French. On his way to Calais, the French outmaneuver him repeatedly, and due to the nature of the fighting, there was no way that he exercised any personal control over anything but the people immediately in front of him during the battle. Henry didn't win Agincourt, the English longbow did. Most of the French knights and men-at-arms were shot down before they even reached Henry's lines. That kind of range and stopping power won the day at Cressy in 1346 and delivered the same results 70 years later at Agincourt. I do think that you're putting a little too much emphasis on the power of the longbow. It is a powerful weapon and powerful tool, but only under the right circumstances. Let's get out of this muddy field, go back to the club, and I'll show you what I mean. This is our tabletop recreation of the battlefield. And when you look at this area, one thing jumps out right away. It is the perfect defensive ground. Woods anchor both flanks of this battlefield, which serve to channel the French attack into a very narrow front. So how do you imagine Henry's longbows would have fared on a more open battlefield where they felt the full weight of French numbers? The longbow didn't win this battle, the terrain did, and on a different battlefield, you would have seen a very different outcome. I'm not sure that's a fair argument. While terrain plays a role in every battle, I think Henry chose this place to deploy his troops because it was most advantageous to his longbows. Yeah, but can we really give Henry credit for choosing this place? I mean, it was actually the French nobles who chose this as the battlefield. The French assumed that they were going to be the ones fighting on the defensive, not Henry. And I mean, they couldn't control the weather. It was honestly just really bad luck for them that it rained the day before the battle and it turned those plowed fields into mud. So what you're saying then is that mud and not the English longbow was responsible for the victory. Uh, I guess in a way I am suggesting that that had something to do with it. But you have to take all of these circumstances into account. I mean, why was Agincourt such a slaughter? It was the perfect storm against the French. Let me advance another theory. What if the victory was not due to English skill, but rather to French incompetence and a lack of an organized French command structure? King Charles and his son Prince Philip were not present at the battle, and by their own design. Instead, they sent a collection of marshals, dukes, and counts to fight the battle without appointing one strong leader to take control of it. I know you're not a big believer in that theory, but it probably is one of many elements. I mean, command, confusion in the French ranks, did play a role in the battle. Oh, it's certainly part of the outcome, and that's going to be part of the challenge. How do you recreate that in a war game of the Battle of Agincourt? I have to assume you have something in mind. I do. We usually do four-player team games with two versus two, but for Agincourt, I'm running the scenario as one English player versus three French. As the referee, I'll be tracking each player's victory points individually, which means even though the French are nominally on the same side, it's still an individual game with one winning player and one loser. I have an historically appropriate humiliation in mind for the player with the lowest score. And what might that be? It's a surprise. Let's just say it'll be Shakespearean. 
If you'd like to play this exact scenario at home with your own miniatures, this and all our scenarios at Little Wars TV are available for free on our website, littlewarstv.com. You can also go to our website for rules reviews, including our deep dive into the rules used for this battle, Days of Nights, published by Chipco back in 2005. The three French players will take up their historical deployment basically in three lines between the woods. The English player forms a single line with the muddy fields, which are rough going and give a movement penalty, in between the two lines. Let's break up into our teams and discuss our strategy for the battle. So I, Henry, by the grace of God, have chosen to meet the French here on the field of Agincourt. We will annoy the French with our archers from either flank and draw them across the field as they seek to dispense with that annoyance. At that time, I will continue to push the archers forward into their flanks, and then once their knighthood is in the midst, I will seize upon them and capture as many of their nobility as possible. My plan is to go across the muddy field as fast as possible and attack the center of the English line in the hopes of capturing or killing their king. In this way, I will earn the victory points. My strategy for today is to try to use the vanguard as, sh as shield as much as possible so I can get as close to the English line as I can. Um, I'm also going to try to send on the right flank a, um, a unit down the road in an attempt to outflank the English left. I have two separate French commands today. I am the Third Battle, which is commanded uh, by historically the Count of Falkenberg. I am also the Cavalry Shock Force, which is an elite group of mounted knights, but historically never even made it into the fight. And I think that'll be my main challenge today because I am so far back in the French ranks. I'm a little bit worried about accumulating enough victory points. Um, what I have to hope is that Josh and Steve get shot up uh, by the longbows and that I will be able to come in and uh, sweep up the victory points at the very end. The battle begins with an intimidating French host bearing down on the thin line of English. All three French players spend their opening turns advancing into the muddy, uncontested field with the English holding firm and not moving up into longbow range. On both flanks, Josh makes good on his pre-game plan to send a few hundred men to turn both ends of the English line. Tom, playing his role of King Henry, is quick to respond. He refuses his right and pushes ahead to counter-attack in the woods near the village of Agincourt. The English are wildly successful in their effort, with a single company of dismounted knights cutting through 1,200 French caught in a column on the dirt road. While Josh ponders how his flanking effort could have gone so far wrong, some of the other players are feeling more upbeat. We have managed to cross almost the entire muddy field. Nothing's happened! Nothing! They have done nothing to me. I am very, very happy with this. Uh, I am not as happy with what is happening on the right flank, but uh, c'est la guerre. Uh, the French have come slowly across the middle as expected. I probably should have moved up and deployed my stakes another turn or two forward uh, to capture them, catch them in the fields. Um, but as it is, I still think we have a lot of opportunity this next round to do some damage. With the French vanguard now bearing down, the English position looks tenuous. Tom's choice not to advance his longbows and catch the French in the muddy fields is coming back to haunt him, though perhaps not as much as his poor dice rolling. A one. Wow. Three mm. ones in a row. Sacre bleu. The French have God on their side. Mon dieu. A one. Ah. That's still three. I mean, Which is a demoralized. The French suffer minimal losses until closing to point blank range. Suddenly, a storm of arrows cuts into the French ranks with devastating effect. When the two lines finally collide, the French vanguard has been weakened but appears in much better shape than they were historically. It is now a battle of close combat, with King Henry himself in the thick of the fighting. Yeah. So I've got some dismounted knights coming in at a plus six. So I'm a six plus one, seven. Seven to seven. Seventeen. Fourteen. Uh-oh. I do more. Henry. Henry's in trouble. Whew. 
It all comes down to this. I started this game with 27 units. I've lost 22. But I've got some knights. They've got the king against the wall. And I'm going to take him down. I feel that God will favor Henry in this moment. Uh, this is a hinge of fate, and I don't feel like it's going to be lost today. I've got a seven. By the grace of God. That's good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's cock. That's either a ten or an eight. Now it's going to be a one. Either one I would win, but... It's thirteen. No! no! It's, now it is a one! A thirteen to an eight. Oh, that is the hand of God. Oh my God! There's that no is... about that. Oh my God! How does it get, <laughs> how does it, how does it get <laughs> cocked on this? How? I can't even do it intentionally. God rules it. It was the hand of God. There will be a theological study. <laughs> oh my God! King Henry may have survived a near-death experience and broken the French vanguard, but there are two more French waves crashing down on the English. The main French battle comes locked in a stalemate, but Greg's third French line hits hard on the opposite end. Henry's brother, the Duke of York, finds himself surrounded by French knights. Go. Oh. Oh. So a great misfortune has fallen the English right where uh, Edward, the Duke of York, was commanding. He moved forward to the line to shore it up. Um, to, to bolster a set of bowmen who were in the process of being overrun, and he died in the process. Uh, it was a heavy blow, the heaviest blow of the day, frankly. The Duke's death triggers a dramatic collapse of the English right flank, but with the day nearing its end, both armies are fought to exhaustion. All right, so here we are. It's turn 15. Darkness has settled over the battlefield. The battle dies down and the game is over. Gentlemen. Nice game. Nice yes. Game. Which brings us to the question, who won? Looking at the figures, we recorded the losses. The English have lost about 3,200 men and the Duke of York, who's killed on the battlefield. The French have lost about 8,700 men, um, roughly half their force, and the English nearly half their force. Given that, at best, Henry might be able to claim some small margin of tactical victory due to the crushing number of French losses, but strategically, this is an English disaster. The French still hold the field. They still block the road to Calais. Henry has little choice here except to surrender or retreat back towards Harfleur with an army half its size and already suffering from disease, dysentery, cold, and hunger. It's tough. I mean, I... Could have shot better. <laughs> but, you know. At the end of the day, uh, I guess we won on points, uh, but obviously not the same as a historical victory uh, at Agincourt, and Henry is now in a bit of a pickle in northern France. So uh, it was a great, great game. Um, like I said, uh, relief is probably the biggest feeling I have at the moment. As the van, my plan was pretty simple. I had to charge across that field as fast as possible, impact the center of the English line, and do whatever damage I could. I got carved up really bad as I crossed, but I hit the line, I pushed the king back, and came within one cut uh, yeah, yeah. of taking him down. Yeah. So it was probably the most devastating effect uh, I, I've ever had <laughs> in a game that I've played, but... Uh, I gotta say, I came this close to accomplishing my goals, so I'm, I'm actually pretty pleased at the end of the day. And you did not score the lowest number of no, victory I points. I did not. How many? No. How many for you? Uh, I think I got two. Two victory points. Two victory, victory points. points. Mm -hmm. Two victory points, which I think is uh, more than somebody else here got. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I was just I was glad to make it across that field, <laughs> and actually have units intact. I'm so sorry for you. Yes, yes, I'm so <laughs> sorry for you. They still go there. Oh no, wait, do I see a head of lettuce? Yeah. What the what? Are we ready to film? Is it, is it on? <laughs> the few of men, the greatest share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not to covetous for gold, nor care I doth feed upon my cost. 
If it yearns me not, if men my garments wear, such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast. If his neighbors and say tomorrow is St. Crispian's, then he will strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day. But we shall, in it, shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. Well done, sir. And now, as I'm covered in garbage. <laughs> Great. Sorry. I didn't mean to hit you in the face. I did. <laughs> oh, that was excellent. Thanks for watching Little Wars TV. Check back next week and maybe someone else will get garbage thrown at them. Check us out at littlewarstv.com.